Kathy, and good uh, almost noon from New York City. And uh, Nitai, what time is it there? It's evening in India. Uh, it's evening. It's late evening. Yes. It's almost uh, 8.30 p.m. Uh, and wh where are you uh, in India? I'm in New Delhi. New Delhi. So uh, I'm very excited uh, to have you here uh, today with us, and I will explain everybody here uh, why I'm so excited. And um, uh, as some of you guys noticed, I mean, not only if this, I, we've been doing this for quite a while. I think this is my 200th session by now, but also the fact that this is, um, you know, uh, people noticed that I started to do those from my, our office in New York City, which means things start to get back to normal and I need to change my video from live in Rye, but I am live in Rye. So today I am in Rye, New York. Uh, and let me tell you a couple of words about my guest today. Uh, uh, and it's not every day that you happen to have uh, a CIO that's so experienced and is leading one of the largest families in India. So uh, Nitai Utkarsh is a financial service professional with deep expertise in the family office and the investment advisory space. He's the lead uh, for investment strategies and the chairman's uh, family office at Hero Moto Corp. That's the world's largest two-wheeler manufacturer. Largest in the world. We'll talk about that. Nitai has been one of the earliest professional to work uh, on uh, family offices in India, key to development and execution of the concept and the first ever commercial launch of multi-family office services in the country. In the process, he also founded and managed uh, an exclusive team of, of portfolio analytics specialized specialists to cater to portfolio management needs of family offices. Nitai has been one of the earliest professionals to work in the family office space in India. Uh, um, key to the development and execution of the concept, I read that already, and the first ever commercial launch of multifamily office in the country. He holds a degree in engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology and MBA from Indian Institute of Management. Hi, Nitai, how are you doing? Hi, Danny, very good. And thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, thank you for being here. And I, and I just want to share with uh, uh, our uh, attendees today how we got to get to know one another and what, uh, uh, and, and, and what you will be helping us doing uh, uh, as well. So um, when uh, uh, I first uh, was looking at the UAE as uh, one of our next destination, and I was very fortunate to meet probably the most well-connected person in the UAE. Uh, both of us know Ro Robin Titus, uh, who's a good friend today uh, uh, and has been a good friend of yours for many years. And at some point, I, uh, I asked Robin, listen, we need uh, to build a good family uh, panel. Uh, you know, what do we do? Uh, I need, you know, we need someone good that can build a, a very strong um, panel there on that. And then he said, you know what? Let me see if Nitai would be available uh, to talk to us. And um, we got together, we spoke. You are, I know we're waiting for uh, the final date from the Ministry of Economy. We had to push the event several times because of COVID, but now, that uh, it's going to be in Q1. Once we get the date, uh, uh, you will be, uh, uh, be uh, behind one of the uh, prominent panels at, at that conference. So first of all, I want to take uh, to thank Robin and most of the amazing guests I have here from the UAE and in general, uh, thanks uh, to his uh, uh, intros. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so You've agreed to do this session with me today and I'm very uh, fortunate uh, to have you here. We're going to talk about the family you work with, Harold and India and everything. Maybe I'll start by asking you about COVID. Usually I ask people how COVID affected their, you know, their, their, their life and their business. Uh, but we need to learn about your business to understand how it affected your business. So maybe first I'll ask you in general, obviously we've been following up on what's going on in India. Uh, I spoke with you several months ago. If you remember, it was a very difficult conversation. You were in the middle of everything. So many people have relatives that unfortunately suffered very badly from this. I heard stories about, you know, the, the, the fact that people couldn't even avoid it because if you're sitting in a building somewhere, it could be a luxury building, could be not, doesn't matter. 
it, it, it came to a point where in the air condition, it was going from one place to another. Anyway, horrific stories. And, and really, I have a lot of uh, good friends in the UAE, including our uh, uh, partner, uh, Biju, uh, who's also from India, that was telling me horrific stories about, you know, um, a cousin of his, that, that 30 something healthy guy, just spoke with him the other day, next day he's gone. So it's been horrific. I wanted to hear from you, uh, what's going on. Yeah. No, it has been pretty bad. And um, thankfully things are changing now, hopefully uh, permanently, although we can never be sure of that uh, with all the talk of the third wave. Uh, but yes, I think the, uh, last year and a half were uh, pretty bad. Uh, I think when it started out, it was not uh, as uh, worrisome as it turned out to be in the second wave, which hit us around March of this year. And I think around that time, almost everybody uh, in India, everybody that I know of lost somebody um, in their circle, whether immediate family or extended family or friends. Um, it was a very, very tough period because, you know, it was not just about losing people to a, to a pandemic. It was also about the entire stress of struggling with resources, struggling with hospital beds, struggling with oxygen. And, um, uh, you know, everybody you, you know was struggling with it and you were trying to help them out. And, uh, uh, it, you know, while I was lucky that my immediate family was not impacted, but there were a lot of people in my extended family, my friends, uh, my college mates who were badly impacted. Uh, all of us tried to help people in, you know, as as much as we could. But a um, um, lot of people lost their lives. A lot of people are still struggling, are still fighting, uh, still trying to recover. It's been almost three, four months, but there are friends and family who are still trying to fight, uh, are still trying to recover from the from the disease. So uh, it, it's been crazy um, uh, on, on the personal side, even on the economy side, a lot of businesses shut down, small businesses. Uh, there are a lot of friends who used to be uh, running their own ventures, startups. Um, and in some areas, obviously, like FNB, hospitality, tourism, travel, um, a lot of these ventures shut down. Uh, so it was both a personal loss as well as loss of, uh, you know, everything that somebody has created over a number of years, all that got lost in the last one year. So it has been a tough period, but the hope uh, that we all have is that um, Soon, this will be behind us if it's not already. Uh, the vaccinations have uh, picked up. Thankfully, uh, India today is probably the, uh, it's got the highest number in terms of absolute number of vaccinated people in the world uh, for any country. Obviously, thanks to our population, uh, it will naturally be a large number. But I think the speed at which the vaccinations have happened has been very heartening. Uh, at least the part about going to hospitals and struggling for your life, hopefully that should be taken care of by the vaccination, whether or not uh, the disease itself gets covered by that, we don't know. But at least the, the, the bad part of it, the hospitalization and the deaths, hopefully uh, you know, that, that should not be the case, even if the third wave comes about. So that's all that we are hoping right now. Let's see how it goes. And then there were a lot of criticism about the government that was basically giving away uh, vaccinations while well, they didn't have enough for their own. Uh, yeah. Did that resolve itself? Did, did you guys end up bringing the vaccinations? People got vaccinated and you think you're on top of things now? Yeah, I think for a large country like India, things like these are bound to happen, whether or not um, uh, you know there was a shortfall because government sent vaccines outside or it was an operational issue. So we, we don't really know what the issue was, but obviously there were challenges, but I think uh, it's been managed very well. And uh, the fact that so many people have got vaccinated uh, is obviously because it's been managed well. So I think things are back on track and the vaccination is happening very smoothly. The technology obviously has played a big role in that. So, uh, you know, everything is being managed through a homegrown uh, app uh, that is uh, developed by the government and 
all the uh, you know all the all the people who are taking vaccinations as well as all the doctors nurses centers of vaccination are all on that one platform so that really helps um and you know for a country like india where now the mobile phone penetration is so huge and internet uh, is so cheap and so widely available uh, i think that has also helped uh, the vaccination uh, program to really reach the parts of the country which otherwise uh, would have been difficult and uh, you know plus we have that distribution mechanism right because of the elections that happen india is the largest democracy in the world so uh, the election system is anyway it reaches all corners of the country so we have that mechanism of reaching out to people so that's being used um, so I, i think it's 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 uh, done pretty well so far uh, so we just hope that i, I think the last that i heard uh, we had crossed or we had reached almost about 60 crore people uh, that's about i think uh, 600 million people uh, roughly uh, who are uh, vaccinated now or at least uh, that many doses i'm not sure whether uh, that's unique number of people but that's quite a large number and the borders are open um not with all countries uh, so people coming into india of course it's open but people going out from india a lot of countries are still uh, kind of uh, wary of uh, uh, opening their borders to india so i think uh, a lot of countries are not really accepting indian people coming into their uh, country because i think we are still getting about 30000 odd cases 40000 odd cases every day uh, although the active case number is somewhere uh, it, it's come down in a big way but still about 30 40000 cases every day I, uh, we cannot wait for things to get better. I, uh, we love India. As you know, I'm from Israel. Everybody in Israel, when they finish uh, the, the, the army, well, the first thing they do is they go to India, right, for a year. Uh, I didn't do that, but uh, most of us do. And, uh, and I want to tell you that my favorite food is Indian food, and I'm married to a Finnish woman. I don't know when was the last time you went to a Finnish restaurant, but Finnish food is basically cold fish, dry cracker, okay. and overcooked steaks. So you can just imagine, uh, I hope there are no Nordics listening to this call. That, that's not a smart thing of, of me to do. So I would like a general overview. You're in the family office world in India. A, a general overview, and I see we have some questions. Um, uh, I will deal with those later. A general overview of the family office space in India. What's going on there? How, how has it evolved over time? Uh, what shape it is currently? And I have some major, I had some major guests from India that uh, you might know, uh, Podar, uh, Satish um, uh, Modi, uh, that, uh, and uh, Princess uh, uh, Janavi, I um, uh, forgot her, the, the last name. Uh, she's also in the asset management and in the royal family. So I had some great uh, guests from India that obviously know the space, uh, uh, but I want to hear from you that really a major part of the family of world What can you tell us? How it evolved? What's shaping it right now? What's going on? Sure. So I, I think the family office space in India is still very nascent. I don't think that it's really evolved the way it has in the West. Um, so there have been single family offices in India for quite some time. And you know, some of the names that you mentioned, and uh, you know, apart from that, uh, Uh, Mr. Abhin Premji uh, is very well known for uh, his own foundation and his own investment entities. So he does a lot of work um, both on investments as well as on the on the philanthropy side. So he's very well known as a single family office. There are others, uh, the uh, co-founders of uh, Infosys, uh, which is one of the first success stories out of India uh, on the tech side. Uh, almost all the co-founders uh, have a family office of their own they were probably uh, amongst the first to uh, start their own single family offices most of the royalty would have their own family offices uh, as you are aware india used to be a country of a lot of different uh, uh, royal households um, so post independence while obviously all of that went away but uh, the uh, Uh, the royal dynasty still exist and they obviously have a lot of inherited wealth so a lot of them have their own single family offices 
but you know, most of these single family offices were not really very well structured when they started out. Uh, they were more like um, having an estate manager to look after uh, the affairs of the estate, having somebody else to look after the investments and the finances, having somebody else to look after some other issues, a legal advisor and tax advisor. So while it had all the elements of a family office, but it was not really structured as a family office. So it's only been recently, I would say maybe about 10, 15 years ago, that the concept of a professional and institutional family office started in India. And you know, I was fortunate to be a part of um, uh, the first launch of a multifamily office uh, in the country where uh, the company that I was working for at that time was looking at uh, 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 you know, offering something different to its uh, ultra high net worth uh, uh, clients, and they realized that the concept of family office is something that could be offered to them. And you know, we did a lot of benchmarking, we did a lot of uh, study on how family offices work globally, and tried to bring that to the Indian audience. And uh, uh, that really was the start. But post that, what has happened is uh, a lot of second generation of business families has come back after their studies in the US and Europe, and they've come back knowing what a family office is and knowing how family offices can help uh, their generation in breaking out of the family business, uh, for example, and starting something on their own. And, uh, and they've come back and told their parents that, hey, you know, we want uh, something like that uh, for our family as well. You know, why don't we set up a family office which will take care of the family wealth which will take care of the succession issues that you have for the family business. And it will free us up to do what we want to do. And it will give us the security and the kind of money that we need to do what we want to do. So I think that was the genesis of the professionalization of family office in India. So whether it is the single family office, which already existed, but was not institutional, or it was the, uh, uh, the, the multifamily offices that came about. I think the core was, uh, or the core reason was that the second generation came back and they realized that they needed it and they convinced their parents that they needed it. So that's how things have been, you know, starting from a very um, unstructured single family office network to now very professional structured uh, single family offices as well as uh, uh, maybe multifamily offices who are trying to initiate uh, the creation of a lot of family offices for the Indian ultra high network. And if you can share how, you know, your story really, how did you end up where you are in the center of this industry? Uh, how did it start? Yeah, so I... Uh, so I was a private banker uh, and uh, I used to work with a lot of uh, ultra high net worth clients uh, for the bank that I was working for at that time and uh, used to advise them on their investments. And I think just after the recession about 2008, um, what happened was that the transactional nature of wealth management in India uh, suffered uh, a lot of problems because uh, all of a sudden the transactions dried down. Uh, clients were wary of investing. They were wary of their advisors. They thought that the advisors were just there to make money for themselves and not align to uh, them. Uh, so they realized that they needed something different. They were not really very happy to uh, keep giving money for transactions. And this affected almost all the wealth managers and private bankers uh, in India, uh, as it did, I think, around the world. And that's when the, uh, the company that I was working for, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank, they started uh, to think about what's next and how do they really pivot and change their business model to ensure that there is uh, uh, continuity in terms of the revenues that were coming in earlier and which had completely dried down. So they hired McKinsey to go out and do a survey and you know, talk to uh, their clients and figure out what will work. And McKinsey said that, you know, why don't you offer something different to your ultra high network clients? Uh, it can't be the same solution that you offer to everybody. You need to have an advisory product for your largest clients. And, um, and the advisory product that they recommended was a family office, was a multifamily office. 
and uh, 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 around that time uh, uh, the bank decided to put up a, a committee a core team which will really look at uh, family office as a concept how it's executed globally and will try and uh, uh, make that work for india make that work for uh, the bank's clients and i along with a few others were picked up from different locations and we moved to the uh, headquarters of the bank in mumbai uh, so i was in delhi at that time as a private banker and i moved to mumbai i stayed there for five years working on this working on the concept looking at how family offices work globally looking at um, how it can happen in india what are the regulations which are there which are not there how do you work with regulators how do you work with the central bank how do you work with uh, uh, with the securities regulator and uh, we did all that and i think that's where we started the uh, the concept of the multi family office and uh, post that i've had the fortune of working with other multi family offices more on the boutique side uh, the bank was obviously a large company uh, and and they were an institutional multi family office but i had the chance to work for a boutique multi family office and then i moved to the other side of the table where i started working for a single family office uh, the first one that i worked for is um the founder of uh, a company called luminous luminous is a company which is in the batteries and uh, energy management space it was acquired by uh, schneider and uh, post that the founder got into a lot of liquidity and he set up his own family of i helped him set that up uh, so that was a lot of uh, learning Don't they have an Israeli connection, or it's a different? Uh, no, okay. Maybe I'm not too sure, but I think so. He does travel to Israel quite a bit. Uh, uh, the principal of the family office, Mr. Malotra, so he does travel to Israel quite a bit. I think he has invested in a few companies in Israel as well. Um, so yeah, so I set that up, and then I moved to this about four years ago. I moved to uh, Hero. uh there i set up the family office for mr manjal and uh now being here for the last four years i think over all these years while my career has changed from a private banker to an institutional multi family office person to a boutique multi family office person to a single family office person uh so like i have changed my roles i think the importance of family office is also kept changing uh so when i was a part of the institutional multi family office those were the kind of things that were just about getting started in india and institutional multi family office was the next big thing and when i moved to a boutique multi family office uh that was when boutique services were uh, sought after and then the single family office now uh, there's almost a revolution in the single family office space in india now almost every month i hear about one or two single family offices getting started uh which is a big deal because uh uh and i don't know how much of that is peer pressure and how much of that is actually guided by real me but um there is a, a big revolution in that space a lot of people getting hired um a lot of new systems and processes getting built the entire ecosystem of uh, product manufacturers service providers realizing the existence of this new breed of investors so i think things have really matured over the last you know 15 to 20 years that I've been uh, a part of this industry and you work right now just for that family for for the family or you also okay so let, let, i'll read a couple of words about uh uh the group from wikipedia actually so hero uh, motorcorp uh is uh, an indian multinational motorcycle and scooter manufacturer headquartered in new delhi company is the largest two wheeler manufacturer in the world uh and they write and also in india well if they're in the world they're probably in india as well where it has a market share of about when this was written 37% in the two wheeler industry as of uh, may 27th uh, the market uh, cap of the company was uh, around 8.5 billion dollars uh, and it is owned by the uh, munjal family um and we talked about it before you know in the US when you think about uh motorcycles you think about i don't know i i don't drive but you know suzuki or hyundai or you know all these guys right uh when in fact what you're saying is yeah but we are way larger than these guys 
so the yeah that's true that's true because i think the kind of places that we are in those are the places which have got the highest concentration of people who actually ride two wheelers right you, you don't find too many people riding two wheelers in the us uh, for example because there the two wheelers the people will ride will be the high end uh, harley davidson of the world but people who actually ride two wheelers for utility for the daily life for going to work uh, for picking up groceries for uh, you know doing normal daily routine work Uh, are, are actually people in countries like India, regions like Southeast Asia, South America, um, Africa. So those are the regions that we are present. In. Those are the regions that we export to. So we have a plant in Colombia. We uh, we are present in almost all South American countries. We are present in a lot of Southeast Asian countries. We are present in African countries. So we export to about forty odd countries globally. um we obviously have a large presence in india uh, and in the subcontinent so we are in bangladesh uh, sri lanka so uh, so in terms of the kind of places where the uh, consumption of two wheelers is the highest i think we are probably the largest out there so and that's the reason why we are the largest in the world so while you may see the high end bikes uh, of different companies but if you actually look at the Sheer number of people using our bikes that will be the largest by far. Amazing, and and so so what are you? I mean, what can you share with us about? Uh, before I go back to our questions, a uh, huge group like that, and you need to uh, help them allocate and manage their their investments. So what what are you looking at uh, for a group like that? Uh, I don't know what you can share or not, but you know what are your preferences uh, when you're looking at the different options. Sure. So uh, there are two parts to it. So the uh, uh, the operating entity, which is Hero Motor Corp, has its own set of uh, uh, investment objectives, has its own set of uh, uh, strategic opportunities that it's looking at. And then there is the family office of the chairman and his family, which is what I look at, where <clears throat> we are looking at um, uh, one is obviously the uh, effective. management of the wealth that the family already has and how do you really manage it how do you ensure that it's structured properly how do you ensure that there is proper planning for succession and um, and then it's also about investing that money across different capital markets whether it's in india or outside whether it's in listed markets or unlisted markets so predominantly the um, uh the family office here is keen to look at early stage uh, unlisted ventures uh, mostly around the mobility space the idea is to identify these uh, potential disruptors early on uh, so that by the time they're ready and they're large enough uh, to disrupt the two wheeler industry the way we know it uh, we are in a position to understand whether we want to get into a strategic tie up or we want to uh, you know look at it as a possible mna opportunity uh, so all that is open to us because we were a part of their growing up years so to say so that's really the objective there as part of our strategy on the unlisted side we try and identify the poten- potential disruptors early on uh, in in mobility space other than that we also look at other uh, tech enabled space like um, you know deep tech spaces of artificial intelligence um machine learning uh, a lot of renewables uh, uh, work on that we have our own um, uh, group company which works in the renewable space it's called hero future energy uh, again on the fintech side we have our own company which is uh, hero fincorp which does a lot of work there uh, there is a lot of technology enabled uh, lending that we are doing from that company uh, we've also started a business in the edtech space uh it's it's called hero wired uh, where we are looking at the entire virtual education space and upskilling the existing workforce as well as people who are um just about to graduate from college and how do we skill them to uh make sure that they get the right kind of jobs so there are multiple businesses that we are in uh, today which are part of the group and then there are multiple businesses that we are investing in purely as financial investors so as a family office uh, uh, all these businesses 
and uh, our stake, the family stake in all these businesses is what we really keep looking at. How do we change that? How do we increase, decrease, uh, manage liquidity, uh, ensure that it all fits into the long-term plan of the family? Um, so yeah, so that's, that's really what we do here. And uh, uh, obviously because uh, it's a chairman's family office, there is a lot of um, interplay between uh, uh, what the operating entity, the motor corp does as part of its overall uh, strategy. So while it's a completely independent entity, but uh, there is a lot of information exchange that happens, uh, uh, you know, in, in a more in, in the most kosher way possible. Um, thank you. Now the investment picture in India. Let's talk about that. The types of asset classes and products most suited to local family offices, and what ways uh, do they diversify the risks, especially uh, post COVID. Yeah, so for family offices in India, I think the entire gamut of products is available. Uh, so on the listed side, uh, uh, you have all the uh, mutual funds and uh, uh, managed uh, uh, funds which are available with very high quality manager. Uh, the thing that is probably lacking is on the alternative side where uh, we still are not up there in terms of uh, uh, strategies. Uh, while there are a few hedge funds, while there are a few alternative funds, but uh, it's again a nascent stage. Uh, and uh, uh, while family offices are looking at investing into those spaces, but we haven't yet really come across a lot of high quality managers locally uh, uh, to be able to do that. And uh, that's one of the reasons why a lot of family offices in India also look at uh, offshore markets to uh, uh, diversify that kind of risk. Uh, where uh, one is obviously the country and the currency risk, but the other is also the kind of products that are available because the plain vanilla products uh, that allow them to participate in Indian markets are there. But if you have to really look at alternatives, you may have to look outside. Post COVID, I think uh, things have been uh, uh, pretty good actually from an investment point of view. So while uh, it's not been good from any other aspect, but I think from an investment point of view, there have been a lot of good deals, a lot of good bargains that the family offices have been able to strike both locally as well as outside. On the unlisted side, especially uh, a lot of ventures which were trading at huge valuations during the COVID period, they became very reasonable. There was a lot of cash crunch because of that bridge rounds were raised at uh, uh, very low valuations. All that has changed, of course, now. Um, there have been some very large ticket IPOs, uh, uh, you know, for people who have been following the Indian market. Uh, a lot of startups have really come out and they have successfully done their IPOs and some of them are still lined up. Uh, so some uh, pretty good stuff happening for the Indian unlisted space. and. Uh, uh, a lot of local funds have raised huge amounts of money. Uh, I think only today I read that one of the funds active in India, uh, Ex Sequoia Group, uh, which uh, uh, launched their own fund, raised almost about um, 500 million uh, for the VC fund, which is quite a large number from an Indian context. So yeah, I think things are uh, things are looking up, um, but yeah, uh, in terms of diversification. Uh, we are looking at the unlisted space and the bargains there. We are looking at offshore opportunities, especially in the hedge funds and alternative strategies. Now, uh, beyond investments, um, what are the typical challenges faced by family uh, businesses um, and, or, and family offices in, in India? How are they solving those uh, challenges? Uh, one of the challenges uh, is obviously the structure, because like we talked about, uh, things are in a pretty nascent stage. So the structure of the family office is still not something that's frozen uh, in terms of how it should be, what are the different things that you should really look at when you're setting up a family office, how do you build a family charter or a constitution, how do you ensure that the succession happens uh, properly, uh, so all those things are still uh, kind of work in progress. We're still trying to learn those things as we evolve. And most business families are facing that challenge in terms of how do you really uh, take the family office concept uh, 
as is as it exists globally and how do you really customize it and how do you tailor it to your own needs which can be very different from those of other families in other parts of the world so i think that's been a big challenge uh, the other challenge is in terms of finding the right kind of resources to man the family office really because uh, today um, because it's in it's it's in its early stages uh, you don't have too many professionals who have experience working with family offices so if you have to hire somebody you have to go out and look for him or her in uh, in associated industries like private banking asset management uh, but there isn't a, a, a pool of resources uh, in the family office space that uh, families can go and hire so all these challenges exist but i think the way we we are all trying to handle that is by creating a network of family offices in india so we are talking to each other more frequently because it's not a large number of family offices it's easy to pick up the phone and call somebody in mumbai or in bangalore and uh, uh, talk to them about what they are trying to do differently how are they solving the specific problems that i am facing and uh, there is a lot of camaraderie and there is a lot of um help that you can get from other family offices from principals as well as executives of other family offices and i think that's that's been working pretty well for us and uh um another question i have is uh regarding the avenues of cross border collaboration uh for uh, indian family offices uh for service provider asset managers and and other family offices globally we talked a little bit about that but um you know would love to learn more um from you yeah so i i think india as an investment destination is really becoming quite big a uh, lot of people uh, are getting interested in india uh, in investing in india however uh, uh, and rightly so uh, they are not really very sure about how do you really get in who do you trust uh, where do you invest and uh you know for most of the world outside the indian uh, subcontinent maybe uh, it's kind of a black box even now and the way to really look at that is if you are entering or if you want to enter into a country where you're not really sure about how things work you're not really sure about who do you trust and who's the right person maybe you can tie up with somebody locally and i think that's one way of uh, some collaboration which we have seen where a lot of family offices in the middle east a lot of family offices in the us a lot of family offices in in europe are really looking at investing into india and they are coming uh, to us and asking us to uh, kind of be there with them as they invest and uh, uh, maybe co invest with them or at least introduce them to the right people Uh, or connect them to the right people right asset managers uh, right kind of opportunities do the basic first level of due diligence on the um, on the investment avenue and uh, give them that status check which only a local can uh, can provide and this works the other way around also because if an indian family office is really looking at investing in 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 a business outside uh, whether it's the middle east or southeast asia or us or uh you are it always uh, is a big help if you can go and tie up with a local family office who knows that space very well who knows that country very well and then try and co-invest along with them so i think that's a big area of collaboration both for inbound interest in to india uh, for investors as well as indian family offices who are looking to diversify and invest outside india and like i said i think the the product piece is obviously very strong any alternative strategy any hedging strategy any multi asset strategy uh, managers who are doing that work because india doesn't have a pool of professionals yet who are doing that very actively while there is uh, uh, there are few products like those but it's still limited i think there is a big scope uh, for such product managers asset managers to talk to indian family offices and try and uh, attract them into investing into their products so so that's definitely a, a big possibility and um uh when when you're looking at co investing really um uh, i i feel many times it's the it's the cultural differences if you look at europe you know that is so segmented so different so many different cultures i think it's harder to co invest there 
while in the US, and I'm just assuming, by the way, I didn't check it. I didn't verify my theory, but in the US it's easier because everybody grew from the same place, more or less, you know, there's not tremendous difference in, 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 um, uh, in, in culture wise. Uh, how do you see it in India? Do you, do you think that's a challenge for an Indian family to co-invest with a American, European family because of that? Do you see more co-investing done within Indian families and, and one another? Uh, not really, because ultimately, I think the business and the numbers speak more than, uh, uh, more than the problems that people may face dealing with each other. So if there is a strong case on the, uh, on the investment thesis and the numbers, I think people learn to put aside the differences, cultural or otherwise. And uh, I think as far as the European culture is concerned, you know, having been, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously as Indians, we have uh, had the background of British rule till about 75 years ago. And most of us um, from, so while the culture is very different, but in terms of language, in terms of, uh, uh, the upbringing of the uh, urban uh, families of India, we're pretty much uh, in line with uh, 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 what uh, a European uh, family would look at. So we are aware of their customs. They are aware of our customs. So it's not that difficult. Uh, in fact, the US is still slightly alien because we haven't really had too many chances to collaborate with the US. So while uh, intuitively it would seem that the US would be easier, but I think for India, because of its association with, uh, uh, with England, uh, I think the European countries are still a better fit. Uh, but honestly, uh, if, if the numbers make sense and if the investment hypothesis makes sense, um, I think cultural differences can be worked on. And uh, I honestly, personally, at least, I haven't seen uh, that being a huge challenge. And when you're looking um, uh, as somebody who watches the markets a lot, uh, when I read the reports from you know the big banks and analysts, they all seem to say you know the market's fine, we're past that, everything has been priced already, which is kind of a weird, you know, from my end, you know, because I'm like, I don't know, 9/11 was way more smaller and only affected a certain area in the world. And the markets took a very big hit and chapter 11 after one another. And here you have such a huge, tremendous disaster. And things look, you know, in the, in the markets like, yeah, we're fine. And I'm like, wait a minute, you, you had all these uh, uh, loans by the governments that were taken from somewhere. It didn't, didn't just come out of nowhere. Those loans would need to be paid. That means higher taxes. That means lower consumption. That means chapter 11s that will no longer, you know, uh, be able to be supported by, by the money from the governments. Uh, employees left to other places, they work from home. Some of them changed jobs, so you lost manpower. I don't know, it sounds to me too good to be true that everything's fine, you know? We had such a, the biggest disaster in history that we can remember and the markets are, you know. Yeah, I think, um... It's also been a, a, a learning curve, uh, honestly, for the world, because uh, you know we saw, or we have been seeing events like these for uh, for the longest of time, so right since the 2000 Y2K piece to to uh, you know other uh, 9/11 to the uh, to the entire downturn uh, during the depression, and all of that has been happening, and it has been preparing uh, the bankers and the uh, industrialists and the markets around the world for something like this. Uh, you know, earlier when all this money was being flooded into, into the market, it wasn't really uh, making any difference. And you know, after a point in time, as it trickled down, the markets really came back and we saw that in 2013 when the paper tantrums happened and uh, we saw most of the emerging markets really coming down uh, at that time because the entire liquidity came down and uh, the markets had really done nothing to uh, with the liquidity that they had, that they enjoyed from 2008 to 2012 maybe. But this time I think it could be different. And the reason why I say it could be different is because people 
hope that the money that is being flooded into the system is going to get into some productive use and the markets will expand because what has also happened is that this has led to huge uh, digital expansion of, uh, of, of most businesses. There are markets that have opened up which were not even there earlier. So I think the kind of money that's flowing into these companies, uh, there is a case that can be uh, built where we can say that, okay, these companies actually can become as big as their valuations indicate because there are new markets which are opening up. Now, if it does happen, it will happen if these companies work judiciously and they use the extra money that they're getting uh, uh, to really expand into the right kind of uh, places, really go and uh, execute their digital strategy well to look at new markets, to look at new sections of the existing markets. If they do that, maybe these valuations can be justified because uh, there will be a complete re-rating that will happen. But if they're not able to do that, if they're not able to learn from previous mistakes and they let this liquidity just go to waste, then of course, I mean, the liquidity has to go away sometime. And if by that time, the economic activity hasn't picked up, then we are going to definitely see the bursting of the bubble, so to say. But we hope that uh, you know, over the last 20 years, there have been lessons learned and the largesse that the banks uh, have been doling out will be used uh, judiciously. At least that's the hope that we have. And what is different this time is that it's actually a case uh, because of the digital expansion uh, to be able to use that to create new markets, to sell your products to new markets, which was not there earlier. And uh, I know that um, uh, several uh, manufacturers of cars are experiencing difficulties because of parts not being produced in the right pace and, and all of that. So my question is, how did COVID affected uh, the company? How did it affect the family uh, from your perspective? And how did you guys deal with it? I mean, yeah. I, I think the uh, uh, after the initial shock um, and uh, I think this was probably the first time that the, that the manufacturing plant was shut down. Uh, first time ever in the last 40, 50 years that the company has been in operation. Um, the, the plants were shut down for quite, quite, quite a while, I think about almost about a month that they were shut down and there was no production at all. So that was a big shock because uh, we had never expected something like that. And uh, uh, obviously there was a lockdown and uh, no markets were open, no dealers were working. So there was no um, bike that moved from our factory to, to, to the go-downs or to the dealers or to the distributors. Uh, but I think once the initial shock wore off, uh, what happened was very interesting because uh, uh, if you're aware, India is a country where a lot of people use public transport. While the public transport itself is not very well developed, but still because it's the cheapest form of transport, so a majority of the population uses that. Uh, even people who could afford uh, an entry level scooter or a motorcycle uh, would typically not buy it because they would prefer traveling by public transport because it was much cheaper. Post COVID, that changed uh, because a lot of people felt that personal mobility is safer than traveling uh, 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 using the public transport. Uh, and people who could afford it went ahead and bought the entry level scooters and motorcycles. And uh, the good thing for Hero was that uh, Hero is the market leader in the entry level scooters and motorcycles. That's our specialty. And that really resulted in an increase in market share for Hero uh, post COVID. And you know, it was one of the few companies that actually increased its market share, not just by um, uh, consolidating the unorganized players, but even amongst the organized players, the market share of Hero increased. Uh, because when anybody was looking at buying, anybody who never used personal mobility, when they were looking to buy a, a bike or a scooter, they invariably looked at Hero, because uh, uh, that's where most of our bikes and scooters are at the entry level. So that worked. Uh, the other thing that worked was the rural uh, India, which is almost 70% of India, did not really face uh, COVID in that big a way. Right. While the numbers have been large in India, they've been mostly concentrated in the urban centers or semi-urban centers, but not
not really in the rural sector. The rural economy continued to prosper. The monsoons, uh, which uh, uh, affect the agricultural output, they were pretty good, and uh, uh, that segment again kept buying uh, two wheelers and four wheelers. So that also helped us. So from a company standpoint, I think it has only increased the market share of the company. Uh, from a family standpoint, obviously, like I was saying, uh, uh, on the investment side, there have been a lot of good deals that we've been able to strike. Uh, especially on the unlisted and the and the venture capital uh, side, where um, after that phase where there were a lot of these deals, uh, a lot of these bargains to be struck, now there is a phase where everything is at the top uh, in terms of valuations. Uh, but that journey from uh, uh, from a stage where people were really struggling to ensure that there is cash in the books to now where there is surplus cash and liquidity, which is uh, chasing these startups, I think we were we were able to ride that wave as as a family who was investing into that space. So that really worked for us. And uh, are you guys back in the office already? Uh, not yet, uh, not yet. We are still working from home. Uh, although the plants are operational, so the uh, uh, the staff which needs to go there is going there. Uh, but wherever we can uh, avoid it, we are still trying to work from home. Well, Nitai, it's been a very interesting discussion to have with you. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, it was very nice to speak to you as well. And I'm looking forward uh, to meeting in person and have you run a great panel at our UAE family office and high net worth conference in Q1. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, thanks again for Robin that introduced us. I want to tell you all that uh, 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 our next session is August 30th, which is really next uh, Monday, where I will be speaking to one of the hottest blockchain projects um, that one uh, uh, journalist uh, uh, referred to as going to be bigger than Bitcoin. So that's going wow. to be August 30th at 11 EST as always. And the next day, my guest is Nitai for the first time, me. I will be doing the first wow. session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will be interviewing myself. Um, uh, it, I'll do this first session as somebody who's been in the family office for so many years uh, with conferences and private dinners and everything, seeing um, so many VCs and private equity, how they approach this space. Some of them make major mistakes. Some of them don't know how to follow up, don't know what to say, don't know how to say. It's a mess. Um, and uh, my session for the first time is not going to be for the family office community. It's going to be for the sell side who's, who's uh, trying to reach uh, the family office space, people like yourself. Uh, and I hope I will give a little bit of insight on what I see from the side, uh, 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 from where I look at things, at what they should be doing. And Actually, yeah, we have hundreds of people that registered. So that's going to be interesting. Wow, um, that'll be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, Nitai, um, again, I would like to thank you so much. Uh, be safe there uh, in India, uh, hoping that things would be uh, behind us, uh, uh, this COVID variant, very soon. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And we will thank definitely so meet in person uh, very soon. Very soon, definitely, hopefully. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good evening from Rye, New York. Bye-bye.